Hello and welcome to episode 198 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here, as always, with Jason Rabinowitz. And how's it going, Ian? Are you happy to have not been flying anywhere today? Oh, it has been a day. I could not be more happy to not be flying anywhere today myself. Unfortunately, for thousands of other folks who are flying, it has been an even longer day than it has been for either of us. We're recording on the 11th of January here. And as it turns out, news broke before we hit the record button. Yeah, we had several people reply to us. <laughs> Do you already record? Are you responsible for this? Yeah. And shockingly, no, we not get to talk about the thing that happened earlier today, not something that happened last week, exactly a week earlier. So this is, this is good news for us, bad news for, for literally everybody else. Right, right. So here's what happened. According to a notice posted in the advisory section of the FAA's National Airspace website, at 2048 UTC on the 10th of January, so sometime Tuesday afternoon Eastern local time, the system that manages the notice to air missions system went down. The NOTAM system went down. Wasn't it a huge issue at that point. There was a notice posted, flights kept going, there was nothing really happening until this morning. When the system that had been backing up that system, they decided that they needed to restart the main system to clear whatever needed to be cleared. And as a precaution, because there were some issues with the system coming back online, the first ground stop for any flights issued was at 527 Eastern on Wednesday, the morning of the 11th. That was a United Airlines specific ground stop. So the airline said, okay, we don't want any of our flights taking off, so let's put the ground stop in place. Ground stop, for those that don't know, listening to the show and catching up on all of the aviation terminology, there's going to be a lot of it today. Ground stop means that if the aircraft is not yet in the air, it cannot depart for its destination. Aircraft already in the air can continue, generally continue to their destinations, but aircraft not yet in the air cannot. And so at 5.27 a.m. this morning, Eastern Standard Time, United went into a ground stop. Then successively, other carriers joined until there was a nationwide ground stop issued by the FAA at 7.21 a.m. Eastern. They said that they're doing that because the system is in the process of coming back online, but not fully functional. So they were going to wait until the system was functional and everything was working well. They expected by 9.30 in the initial notice that that would be resolved at 9.04 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The ground stop was lifted, but because of the volume of ground traffic that created, there was kind of additional ground stops for airline or airport specific places. Where the damage the rest of the day. Done. Yeah. Basically, your major hubs where United, American, and Delta are having to deal with too many planes on the ground at any one time. So they don't want any more planes clogging up the works. So things running late today, but cancellations not too bad, about 1,800 total cancellations. And looking at delays in the US, about 9,000. When it shakes out at the end of the day, it'll probably end up being closer to 10,000. But that delays much better than total cancellations. Total cancellations very low as a total proportion of the total number of flights operated, about 50,000 flights operating in the US each day. And not nearly as many as canceled last week as there were last week. So that's the good news. The bad news is we don't know what happened yet. Somebody must know, or, or I'm sure by the time this podcast comes out in a couple of days, there will be a better idea of what happened. But for something as critical as the NOTAM system to go down, I don't really recall this happening any time in the recent past. It's a pretty Michigan critical thing. And we actually have a prior episode of this podcast, I think it's somewhere in the 60s, episode, episode 65, 65, where we yes. discussed the NOTAMs, what they are, what they contain, why they're problematic, and why they're so important. Basically, if you've ever been at the gate right before a flight board, you might see a dot matrix printer spewing out what would appear to be hundreds and hundreds of pages of just junk 
stuff. That's yeah. all the notums. That's information about runway closures and a crane operating three nautical miles in the vicinity of runway 31 left at JFK. Nobody cares about that, but it has to be in there anyway. No one can possibly read this whole thing. But there is some very vital information in there about runway closures or taxiway closures or things flight crews need to know about. And without that system, it is not safe for them to operate, according to the FAA, when they issued that ground stop. I'm sure the airlines would agree with that. What was interesting was that at some point, the NOTAM portal is not the only place where you can pull down NOTAMs from. You can also get it from the DOD and other places. But at some point, they said the information coming from the DOD NOTAM page might be unreliable. So there's some question there on exactly what that means. Was the data just out of date because the FAA system was down? Does it mean something else? I don't know, but I would love to have the answer to that question. And someone did point out to me on Twitter that this seems like and probably is the largest ground stop issued by the FAA since 9-11. I can't possibly think of any other event where there was a nationwide ground stop for several hours. Yeah, I can't think of anything that was this widespread and this long. I mean, thankfully, it only lasted a few hours. There have been some issues, I think. A couple of years ago on the West Coast when ERAM went down, which is a part of the flight tracking system that the FAA uses, that went down on the West Coast and there was a West Coast ground stop for a while, but nothing nationwide. I don't know if that's happened. Yeah. I, I mean, in the intervening years, we've seen entire area control centers lose the ability to operate flights. And you know, the issue that happened at the Chicago Control Center a few years ago with a sabotage and resulting fire. And then there was the, I think it was the Washington Center a few years ago, and that went ATC zero and everyone had to fly around that airspace for a while. But those were impacting a large number of flights, but localized and certainly didn't require ground stopping all flight activity. Yeah, no. definitely going to be something next week to talk about when we hopefully learn by then a lot more about what happened. And I just want to know how a few United flights actually did sneak out in the six o'clock hour today. They were like, when I woke up, someone said, go look at United and I'm like, wow, there's nothing except for long haul flights coming into the US except for like one 6 a.m. Newark to Denver flight managed to sneak out. I'd love to know how that one flight made it out. I mean- One of life's mysteries. We'll never know. Yeah, we'll never know. Maybe they pulled all their paperwork and were just really on top of things. But the other smaller and- Slightly less interesting, but curious part of the story is that Canada's NOTAM system also went down today. You know, you say less interesting, but I think that's even more interesting. And Canada has said it didn't actually impact flight operations. They did not have to issue a ground stop or anything like that. But the NAV Canada did confirm that whatever their issue was, was unrelated to the FAA's issue. That is they believe highly- it to be. They believe it to be unrelated. I just find that highly suspicious that two countries, two completely independent organizations suffered extremely similar failures of systems that do not typically ever experience failures of this nature on the same day, in the same half a day. That is, I'm not going to make any wild accusations, but I'm sure you can all think of what I'm thinking about here. Very suspicious. I think that they said so quickly that they don't believe it's the same thing leads me to believe that whatever happened in Canada, like they know exactly what happened. And I don't want to say anything about what I think happened in Canada before they do, but to be so confident that that it's not related, I feel like the Canadians know exactly what happened already. But we don't know what happened in either case. And so if you're listening to this Friday and you already know, take that with a grain of salt. Go back in time and tell us now. Yes, that would be great. But I will say that it was two things. One, it was very nice to have not recorded and so we could talk about what had happened today. But also, I thought the FAA did a decent job, as they usually do, at providing as much information as they could, especially on a system where most people who are flying have no idea that that system exists. Yeah, FAA did a great job of putting out constant high-quality updates. The DOT secretary put out updates himself in video form, so that was good. Southwest put out more updates about the FAA's failure today than it did of its own failure the other day. So 
I guess maybe they learned their lesson that <laughs> communication is good. I don't know. But the FAA couldn't really have asked them to do anything more for the public in terms of keeping people up to date. But that's not unusual for the FAA. Right. Let's just hope they're as forthcoming with information about what happened to the NOTAM system as they find out and hopefully we find out not long after. We'll leave that conversation there for now and probably come back to it next week as we learn more. So stay tuned for that. Jason, we have talked a lot about pilot shortages, be they real lack of hiring, lack of the ability to hire pilots, claims that there's a general pilot shortage and what the problems are. And then we've talked more recently about what regional carriers are doing and what mainline carriers are doing to attract pilots. And one of the big, big, big things last year was the huge pay increases that regional carriers, specifically the wholly owned regional carriers for American Airlines, made to their pilots. And this week, there was an interesting article our friend Ned Russell wrote quoting a Raymond James analyst about how that didn't quite work out the way they thought it would. Yeah. So basically what happened was American opened the money spigot for its wholly owned subsidiaries Envoy, Piedmont, and PSA, according to Ned's article, to nearly the level earned by its own pilots. So the move doubled the cost of its regional operations, which have, of course, long been a lower cost option for mainline airlines to operate to smaller cities. But the problem with that was that may not have been an intended consequence, but Ian, you think otherwise perhaps, that American may not have anticipated basically all of the other regional airlines matching that enhanced pay. So I think the goal for them, what they were thinking was, we're going to offer more pay, we're going to entice pilots to come over to Envoy, Piedmont, and PSA, and we're going to have a great supply of pilots for our regional airlines while the others were suffering. And they probably didn't or may not have expected other airlines to match that pay. And it's kind of a zero-sum game now, according to the analyst that Ned is quoting here, where basically they have just made operating the regional airlines much more expensive to the point where there are consequences now, where airlines are having to pick and choose which airlines they suspend service to. So this past week, American announced it would suspend service to three smaller cities. One of them is actually not that small, but Columbus, Georgia, Del Rio, Texas, and Long Beach, California, not exactly a small destination. American will be pulling out of those outright, citing the pilot shortage and weak demand at those airports. Delta and United have already exited those markets, which is also problematic. But we're ending up in the situation where some cities that only had one airline operating one of the regional airlines now have nothing, which is obviously, if you're in that city, not a great outcome. But I'm kind of leaning to the side of this analyst that this probably wasn't the intended outcome because why would it be? But you disagree, and I want to hear your take. Well, it's not that I'm necessarily disagreeing with the result here, because I don't think you can argue with that. I guess there's two things that I'm thinking here. One is if I'm an airline and I'm going down this route, obviously I've done some sort of analysis that incorporates the fact that it would be possible for other airlines to do the exact same thing that I'm about to do. And I can't imagine that American didn't say, okay, what happens if, and then didn't game out what happens if all of the other regional airlines manage to raise their pilot pay and become just as competitive on compensation as they were about to do. That I can't believe that they wouldn't do that. If they didn't do that, that's a whole nother story. But the other thing about this is it, it kicks off something that has to happen anyway. If they're going to solve that, you can't get mad at airlines for saying we have a pilot shortage and then everyone goes, well, maybe you should pay them better. And then when they do pay them better, you get mad at them for realizing those economics as they come at them. So I, I think there's a thing here where the analysts seem to be like, well, you're paying your pilots more. That's dumb. Well, <laughs> That's dumb in the short term. Right. And that's fine. If you're a financial analyst, your goal is to get to the next quarter. And we've talked multiple times about the reasons that I don't like that. And I think that that's short-sighted. And I think in the long term, paying pilots more, especially pilots at regional carriers, is going to be beneficial in the long run. But you also have to realize what's going to happen in the short term. And I think that this was 
kind of baked in. So when they were like, they made the bet and it went wrong. I'm not sure that they made the bet and it went wrong. I think this is just the logical conclusion or logical next step in a long process. See, that's why I wanted to bring up this topic. I wanted to have that conversation. Good job. But at this point, then then what's really the benefit of even having these regional carriers, just the smaller aircraft? If it costs as much to operate these aircraft, I mean, yeah, you probably have one less flight attendant, maybe two fewer flight attendants than a much larger mainline aircraft. But at this point, it seems like there's almost there's no benefit in operating a CRJ-900 instead of, let's say, a 737-700 or whatever, or an A220. Or in Delta's case, the 100-seat 717 is probably a great aircraft for them right now. But it, it just seems like there's a, a missing chunk to the conclusion from this analyst here. There's just something something missing. And I think you raised the point exactly that they're probably only looking from short-term gain over long-term sustainability. Yeah, I think it's going to take a long time. I mean, for a long time, the system's been very broken. And so I think it's going to take a long time to try and fix that broken system. And of course, Ned being Ned, he brings up that maybe buses are the answers. (laughs) And, And we haven't seen much expansion in that since the burst of American and United introducing landline bus service last year. Delta hasn't dipped its toes into that at all yet. But that I would expect to see more of that tertiary city 60, 100 miles outside of the hub being operated by a bus instead of a very expensive regional jet. And also he mentioned subsidies that maybe instead of essential air service just at the federal level, maybe there needs to be some enhanced level of subsidies coming from cities and towns rather than just federal and at the state level. I might get yelled at for saying this, Uh but- it might also behoove airlines to consider propeller-driven aircraft. I'm just not in this country, sir. Uh-uh. <laughs> they seem to work in every other country in the world. You say that, but I guess we can just add this in. Literally, one of the only propeller operators in this country, Horizon, one of Alaska's brand, their regional brand, yeah. is flying a bunch of them to Victorville today. And I think they only have three left, the Dash 8 Q400s in their fleet, and they'll be gone in a couple of weeks. So the propeller aircraft are not doing well in this country. No, not in this country, but they seem to work everywhere else. So take that with you know whatever you want. The EV tolls are propeller. Get driven, out, so get that. out. Oh, Moving all right. on. I crossed, Moving I crossed the line. You crossed the line. You went too far, sir. I went too far. So it's the beginning of the year, which means we get to talk about the end of last year. And by the end of last year, I mean Boeing and Airbus 2022 deliveries. The numbers are in. And as we've come to expect over the past few years, at least Airbus delivered more aircraft than Boeing did. But the numbers were much, much closer this year. A total of 661 Airbus aircraft going home to customers versus a total of 480 going home to Boeing's customers. Yeah, pretty incredible that it wasn't a particularly good year for either of these, but Airbus still managed to crank out 246 A320neos, 264 A321neos. That's pretty impressive. Boeing on its own, even though we started the year with the MAX not doing so hot at all, they managed to also deliver 374 MAXs, which is, again, pretty outstanding for all things considered. Not great overall, but it's going to take a couple of years for supply chains to get back to normal. I don't know if they'll ever get back to normal, but get back to some sense of normal before they can really start pushing the uh, envelope of what's possible with these production lines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Airbus was targeting over 700 aircraft to go home this year. So they fell short, but things, as they have very openly said, we weren't able to put enough aircraft together to deliver them. So that's a big part of the puzzle for both Airbus and Boeing for all manufacturers, really. Top line numbers, Airbus 60 A350s, 32 A330s, and that includes the military variants that move over to Airbus Defense and Space before they're delivered to uh, military and government customers. Three, pulling out some interesting things, three A330-800 NEOs. Uh, that's uh, important to call out. 516 A320 families, all NEOs, including six A319 NEOs. 
Six. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. include ACJs, I think, too. Yes. Right? The deliveries yeah. to uh, China Southern and China ACJs. Southern, I think, took a pair or maybe three yep. of the 319 Neos. Not a popular aircraft. No, it is not. And then 53 A220s with a very, very lopsided but not unexpected split. Six A220 100s and 47 A220 300s. And then Boeing's total, I mean, just like Airbus, a huge tilt towards narrow bodies, 374 MAX, as Jason mentioned, dozen of Poseidon aircraft, which are based on the 737-800 frame, five 747-8Fs, including all but one from the final run of the 747 production line, 15 767-2Cs, which are the KC-46 tankers. 18 767 freighters, just three 777 300 ERs as we try and bridge the gap to the 777X, but 21 777 pure freighters, and then 31 787s with the dash eight bringing up the rear, deservedly so, because it is the worst of the 787s. Wow. Just calling it as you see it, huh? I've said that multiple times on this podcast. The only people that should be surprised are the people tuning in for the absolute first time in this episode. I have been the very clear. I don't know. I've been <laughs> very clear on my position about the 787-8. All right. Well, I will say looking at Boeing's numbers, we can clearly see where the trend is heading in the future. It, it's going to be weird in the not too distant future to look at Boeing deliveries commercially and see either airlines took the one aircraft or they took the other. It's either going to be a 737 MAX or a 787 of some variety. The 777X is not a hot selling aircraft. The 76 is not in production for passenger airlines anymore. The 747 is gone. 757 is gone. So really, they're down to the, the 73 and the 78. And it's just, it's just so weird to see that huge gap in size between those two aircraft without really anything in between them. You want small or large? We got them both, but that's it. <laughs> so those are the aircraft that went home for the year. And as Jason mentioned, not a stellar year, but healthy numbers. And looking forward to next year to see how trending many- Trending upward. Trending upward and, and seeing how many aircraft go home. So let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, we are going to have a fascinating conversation with Casey Humphreys, who is with the United Network for Organ Sharing, and Chris Curran, who is at New England Donor Services, about the logistics and transportation of organ donation. This is going to be a great conversation. So stick around. After the break, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We have a very special conversation today, a conversation with Casey Humphreys, who is the Logistical Products Service Line Leader, and she will explain what exactly that is in just a moment, and Chris Curran, who is the SVP of Organ Utilization for New England Donor Services. We are here today to talk about organ transplant logistics, something that kind of before this week, Jason and I had never really even thought about covering on the podcast because we didn't really know anyone that was doing that. But now we have two people who do that for a living. So Chris and Casey, thank you so much for joining us to talk about this today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hey, welcome. And for some context, this topic was brought to our attention by an external PR firm who actually framed it in the way that brutal winter storms and other emergencies recently have been causing havoc in the commercial flight network, primarily Southwest, the biggest airline operator domestically in the US. But organ transplants have to continue, obviously. This is literally a life or death situation. And they're not going to let a few thousand canceled flights every day get in the way of saving patients. So this is a really good opportunity to bring some light to a topic that most people probably don't ever want to have to think about. Yeah, it's definitely something that I haven't given a lot of thought, and I'm really glad to learn a lot more about it. And I hope our listeners really enjoy this conversation. Casey, Chris, can you walk us through the process of how logistics become involved once an organ donor has been identified and a recipient has been identified, how does an organ get from point A to point B? Right. So I think, you know, the answer to that greatly depends on where is the organ starting from and where is it going and what type of organ it is. Organs are allocated, obviously, to patients based on how sick they are or a combination of other factors that determine their 
how sick they are and how soon they need a transplant. And that allocation to those patients also happens within a geographic circle surrounding where the donor organ recovery is taking place. So for example, if we have a donor in Boston, kidneys are allocated to patients uh, perfect matches, and then beyond that to patients in order of a list that are within 150 nautical miles. So, you know, a lot of that takes place by air and by ground or a combination thereof. But, you know, most kidneys, if they're going to travel a distance that needs flight, they're going commercial, they're going in cargo and often hand carried by a courier and tended with cargo on the that airline and then picked up by a courier on the other end. Whereas abdominal, uh, the liver and thoracic organs are primarily transported if they do need to fly by a charter flight. So, I mean, that's generally how it happens. Once we've identified candidates, we will start to look at what logistical arrangements need to be made to get the organs there in as short a time period as possible after they've been recovered. You mentioned the liver and thoracic organs need a charter flight. Is that because of the time they can spend outside of a body being different than kidneys? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, speaking just in generalities, yeah, the kidneys, if they're, you know, young, otherwise healthy kidneys, they can last a long time following the organ recovery. Whereas, you know, kidneys from older donors, the transplant programs like to put them into their recipients a little bit faster and keep that cold ischemic time low. But for liver and thoracic organs, often it's the team that accepts the organ, the transplant program that accepts the organ, is actually often doing the organ recovery, sending a surgeon to the operating room to do the recovery of the organs. And therefore, they're turning around and getting right back on the charter plane and and flying back to home base to do the transplant. So that's interesting. It's actually a round trip kind of thing where I always imagine that the local hospital would do the surgery to remove the organs and then box it up and then ship it out. But you're saying that they actually, the receiving hospital organization actually dispatches their surgeons out first to recover the organ and then they take it back with them. Is that how that works usually? Yeah. For most thoracic organs, that's definitely the case. If the heart was allocated to a patient in Chicago from a donor in Boston, then chances are that transplant program that accepted that heart in Chicago would send a surgeon to Boston to evaluate the organ, make sure it's functioning well in the donor, and then recover it and fly back to Chicago for the transplant. But yeah. And you said a courier carries it, then it travels via cargo with the airline, and then a courier receives the organ on the back end. How does that work? Is there somebody at United American Southwest that they're the point person that you you know, you call them up and say, we have a kidney today or, or we have a liver today. Yeah. I mean, again, it depends. And, and most kidneys don't get on a commercial flight. I mean, that's really just when they need to get the distance. But we work with specialized courier companies or organ procurement organizations work with a lot of specialized courier companies that have those direct relationships with the airlines. You know, they kind of the couriers themselves go through a TSA process, a vetting process, and they will, you know, work it out with the airlines to find the best flights and the best connections and sometimes avoid connections that seem like they could be challenging to make the connecting flight. And so I think a lot of the couriers out there that we work with, they're not just kind of local couriers. They're really national couriers that specialize in this type of work. Casey, I want to bring you in by asking you the question that I promised we would get an answer to at the beginning, logistical products service line leader. That is a fantastic title because I feel like it means that you have your fingers working in all different directions and you're doing everything. Yes, kind of. So (laughs) from our perspective, so I'm at the United Network for Organ Sharing. And so we are the nonprofit organization that's responsible for running the transplant system, running the match algorithm, the IT systems, developing the policies, etc. with a network of volunteers, professional and patient volunteers. Chris has been one of them. So We're responsible for doing that on behalf of the federal government through a contract. So for a long time, logistics, and I mean, still today, logistics is done by those local partners, those organ procurement organizations, Chris and his team in Boston and the surrounding areas. And there's 56 organ procurement organizations across the country who are really in the weeds of and planning these trips and making sure that organs are making it from A to B safely and efficiently. 
And so they've been doing that locally. But so we as a system, I'm saying that broadly, our IT system, we haven't had our hands in that process. However, what we have encountered over the years, particularly since 9-11, but prior to 9-11, organs were allowed in the cockpit or near the cockpit on the plane. So they were above wing and you really had somebody who had eyes on it and had hands on it pretty much the entire journey. Also, back then we were moving less than 18,000 organs a year total. It's the number of transplants in 2001. However, Fast forward now to you know, last year, 2022, we had, for just deceased donor transplants, we had more than 36,000 of them. Wow. Uh, so the volumes have just changed astronomically. About half of those transplants were kidneys. So a little bit over half. So about 20,000 in 2022 were kidneys. And different areas of the country fly different percent of those kidneys, depending on their local infrastructure, right? If there are fewer transplant programs in the area, they may move their organs further. They may need to fly more regularly. And so since 9-11, you know, back to that point, Organs were reallocated to the cargo hold. And so we had to go through the cargo process. So that's we're beholden to cargo hours, to cargo processing, cargo lockout times. So in a realm where you know minutes matter, we need to know exactly where that organ is going and be able to get it to the airport between 60 and 120 minutes before the flight takes off because of those cargo lockouts. We don't always know in that kind of time frame where it's going. And the organs have a certain amount of time they can be outside of the body. So we're eating into that time by having to be part of that process. There's a whole host of things, you know, cargo hours flying to a place in the middle of the night where the cargo office isn't open. But there's a patient on the other side that needs that transplant and they need that transplant now. But no one can get the organ because it's in the cargo office. That so, is... Seriously interesting. Wow. And, and I don't think many people listening to this podcast would have assumed that. And now I hope is the part where you transition into saying, well, the federal government is looking at this again, and there is legislation pending to undo this mistake that made since 9-11. I'm hoping that's where you go to now. If not, how do we do that? Sure. Well, so that was my introduction to my job, which is <laughs> you know, we are now focusing our perspective as UNOS, as that nonprofit, as partners and contractors with the federal government and partners with the entire transplant community, we know that we need to be at that table and we know we need to put our weight behind some of these conversations to make things change for the entire system, for the benefit of every patient that's waiting for an organ. So we recently sent a letter to the secretary of the DOT asking for a meeting to talk about some of these commercial challenges. And that letter came out before everything happened with Southwest here recently. And Southwest closed their cargo offices entirely. Wow. So you think about how we move organs, and then you think about the potential impact if a carrier like Southwest closes their cargo process. Now, we have very creative people in the field, and they will move heaven and earth to get a transplant to the patient who needs it. And so they have, and I've spoken to a couple of OPOs who work primarily with Southwest, and they've said, we're doing our best and nothing's gone awry because we are burning the midnight oil, we're driving things, we're kind of going above and beyond to ensure that patients receive these transplants. And, you know, that we honor this precious gift that people gave us. But so my role is to help coordinate some of these efforts. And we have a tracking system that we've created. So I'm in charge of that. We have some tools that we're developing to help coordinate what flights are available and take into account those lockout times, those cargo hours to say, don't even look at these flights because they're not possible. Here are other flights that you could do. So you have more information when you're placing an offer with a transplant center. What is the scope of the flights that are available? When could you get it there? reasonably, being able to provide more of that information, supporting the efforts to have this conversation with Secretary of the DOT. And of course, we're asking in that letter to have representatives from the FAA and from TSA and from others, because it's going to take a village to solve this kind of problem. Going to take an act of Congress even. Very well could take an act of Congress. And there's been interest, and I know Chris has been involved in one of the committees that creates the policies that were then enacted. And they've, they're the OPO committee, the Organ Procurement Organization Committee. And they've been looking at 
what other kind of policies can we put in place to ensure that organs are are moved in the most efficient way possible? They've looked at different data. We ourselves have done some data collection projects to try and see what information we can gather so then we can identify those pain points beyond the operational side of things. So to your point, I kind of have my fingers in a variety of places and some product development, but also in some more of the operational and political spaces to try and see how else we can move the needle and what folks do we need at the table to really make a difference and provide some relief to what is a real challenge in moving organs to the patients who need them. Wow. I mean, I said at the at the beginning of this conversation that I didn't really have any idea what goes into this, but now I'm kind of just in awe that anything gets anywhere given the changes that have happened over the past you know, 20 some odd years to how things are moved. I mean, a doubling of the number of transplants and a change in how things are transported. Has this driven kind of a charter market for organ transplants? Have you guys looked into that? Or is it just, you know, such a logistical challenge beyond what's already an immense challenge that it's not kind of not something that happens on a regular basis? Well, I can answer from some experiences, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it works out. It does work out that we can get a kidney to the commercial airline and tend it on time and land on time and get to the patient that's awaiting this precious gift. I think, you know, for those times when it's not lining up, as Casey pointed out, you know, we do get creative and we look for ways to get things there by other means. We, a couple months ago, had a kidney that needed to get to Florida, and there was really no viable option other than to use a charter airline, a charter flight. And so we did, and we made it happen, and the patient got the transplant. But, you know, I think each one of these things, well, the numbers are staggering, and we're helping a lot of people through organ donation and transplantation. I think we also need to focus on every single one of these as a vital opportunity and unique and make sure that every single one goes well, even if it's 40,000 times a year. So, you know, to Casey's point, yes, yeah, sometimes we got to get creative. And I think relying on new technologies and emerging technologies is also something that we need in the future. So, you know, there are programs looking at, could we use drones? One of Casey's products at UNOS is GPS trackers that go with the organs. So we know where the organs are at all times so that we never miss an opportunity or risk that we don't know where the organ is when it's being transported by air. So when you do utilize a charter service to get an organ from A to B, are there charter airlines or or charter companies that you typically look to first that specialize in this kind of transportation? Or is it very much you'll take whatever is available at that given moment? Yeah, so it's a great question and it depends is the answer. So I started to sound like a lawyer, but it depends. We <laughs> you know, if if we're putting people on the plane, you know, on a charter, then we consider the safety standards of the operator. And if it's gonna be the organ traveling alone, then it does of course widen our pool. And, and we will look at things like Argus rating or Wyvern rating and things like that. But we work with, you know, a couple of operators in the Northeast here in Boston that do kind of cater to our needs. You know, they are kind of giving us dedicated flight crews and dedicated planes and having them on standby. We also operate our own CJ4 that we base out of Bedford. And there's a couple of OPOs in the country that operate their own aircraft as well to make sure that there's, you know, always an option available to move an organ. That's interesting. So are those aircraft on standby pretty much all the time with like a certain window of notice? Or is that something where you have a little more lead time and say, oh, we'll use our own aircraft? Well, so I mean, for I can only speak to our experience. So operating the CJ4, sure, sure. We, we have seven pilots that are dedicated to this plane and this operations. And so, you know, we can call them with the two hours notice and have them ready to go on a flight to go get an organ or, to, or bring an organ someplace. And of course, if that plane is flying or the crew is in rest, you know, after their duty day, then we rely on backup charter options from a few specific providers that really do cater to donation and transplantation and are building their their service models with that idea in mind. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I had to look this up. CJ4 is a Cessna Citation, actually. So that's a 10-seat a passenger jet. Didn't know the short name for that aircraft. So if anyone else didn't know, that's a Citation. Sorry, yes. Cessna Citation, yes. We're normally talking commercial flights. So it's uh, anytime we veer off that course, Jason and I... I, I had to look it up. I was stumped. Falter. <laughs> yeah. So this question is certainly for the both of you. What happens when something goes wrong? What happens when a flight that's supposed to be transporting an organ you know, has a mechanical issue and, and, and can't depart? How does a negative situation get resolved? Obviously, because it needs to get resolved rather quickly. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the scenario and the organ and the location, but we're very fortunate that if we're near a major hub that you know we can look for alternatives. We can preserve organs now preservation devices that can kind of lengthen that time from organ recovery to transplantation. And so that does give us some, you know, additional support, although those pumps can't actually uh, travel in commercial airlines. So the pump we use is it's a kidney pump called the LifePort, Organ Recovery Systems LifePort. And, you know, they have four of those batteries in the back that the airlines don't want. Oh, lithium ion batteries. Yeah. Uh, okay. And of course, it's a machine that ideally would be accompanied by a person. You know, so we do try to employ some of those technologies to, you know, if a kidney can't get out on a flight until 6 a.m., that, you know, we place the organ on a device, preserve the organ overnight, and then package it the next morning right before the plane so it can get out on time. So, you know, we try to look for additional options that can extend those times. Casey, I think you mentioned that you obviously try to avoid flight connections when transporting an organ, but sometimes I'm assuming that there isn't an option, that you have to go through a hub to get from A to C via B. If you do misconnect or a connecting flight cancels, it's happened to all of us, and the the organ gets stuck in Chicago O'Hare, what options do you have at that point? Could you go to plan B and, and see if there's use for that organ locally or do you send it back home? Where do you go from there? Yes, that's exactly what is often done in that case, where there are no other options to get it to the program that had originally accepted that organ for their patient. There are ways that that the organ procurement organization can look more locally for another recipient for that organ and then you know, do everything they can to then get it there. And, and that may require a different flight, right? But at least it's a flight to somewhere where you've already vetted that it can get there. Because now you kind of you, you know where you are and you're the kind of the whole scenario has changed. And so now, you know, I can get a flight from here to there and I, it can leave at this time. Will you accept this organ? And so there are ways to kind of make that work and make sure that that, um, that precious gift um, makes it to somebody who is still in need of that transplant. And you know, as I said before, the organ procurement teams will move heaven and earth to make sure that that gift is is utilized. So it's just making me anxious, even just thinking about that. I mean, I know we've all misconnected flights by just a few minutes, and I track, of course, using Flight Radar, I track my inbound aircraft to see if my inbound flight will be late, and then I just can't. It makes me anxious just thinking that a, a missed flight connection could have such a huge impact on somebody's life like that. When I'm just upset if I miss my hourly shuttle flight to DC, this is just operating on a, on a whole other level that I, I've never thought about before. Yeah. And there are other ways that the community and that the specialized couriers have kind of come up with ways to help in the moment. And you know, we, like I said, organs move in cargo. However, some of the courier services that are specialized for transplant, they have where you can have an onboard courier. And so you pay for literally a staff member to make that organ their carry on. And so they are holding that organ through the flight. And then you have a person there, right? Which is different than, you know, when there's an organ by itself. Now you have a person to walk to the counter and go, I need to get on that flight. And you have kind of a person to help navigate in the airport when those kinds of things happen. So there are kind of backup systems and really kind of cottage industries that have come up just to make sure that we, you know, that we're being good stewards of that gift. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, this whole... You know, thankfully, those circumstances where something doesn't get where it's supposed to go is rare. But what it does, you know, then you are kind of walking a fine line of wanting that intended recipient to get their transplant and doing everything you can to get it there. 
once you realize that maybe that's not going to happen, making sure that the organ is used for somebody else, that it still goes to a deserving patient that's available. And so, you know, one of the things that we've done in the past is if it, you know, and thankfully it is rare, but when it does happen, call your friends at other organizations and say, hey, listen, it didn't make this flight, but can you place it on a, on a device to preserve the organ until I can get it where it needs to go or I can get it to another patient? So I think not just a, along the lines of transportation options or delays to look at what uh, other things can be employed to make sure that the organ itself still gets transplanted. And so, yeah, it does require some creativity. And at the end of the day, we want the organ to go to the next patient on the list. But sometimes you need to make sure that the organ is, is going to get used for deserving patients. So I want to go back just a moment to what Casey was talking about with the onboard courier, because that's kind of what I had in my head all along is, is somebody walking into an airport holding a cooler. I mean, that's what you've always seen on TV and movies, right? It's just some right. guy with a cooler that says like live organ or something on it. So I guess the question, because so they're traveling in cargo most of the time. How does that distinction get made between, is it just a question of cost and hiring someone to go with the organ, so then it can become something that's carried in the cabin? Or is there more to it than that, that often prevents that from being the situation? Well, I guess, again, we're talking specifically for kidneys. You know, the kidneys can tolerate that time, as we talked about. You know, they can go 24, 36 hours from being recovered to getting transplanted. And so you do have the benefit of time that you can utilize a commercial flight. You know, I think I it used to be, uh, you know, I think, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten on a plane where you did see, and this is again, back in the day, there'd be corneas or kidney in that front closet up <laughs> up by the flight attendants at the front of the plane. Can't say I've ever run into that myself. <laughs> I have a lot of flight attendant friends and they used to, some of them used to hand carry corneas or the, or, or an organ you know, once it was tendered with the airline. So we certainly, that did used to happen. I think Casey brings up all the points of why it doesn't happen anymore. I think it would be hard to utilize a, a hand carry every single time. You know, we all know how booked planes are these days and how often they're overbooked. And so then you run the risk that that person can't get on a plane. So in quite honestly, the kidneys, when they are packaged, don't need a person to carry them as long as they're going to be dealt with care by the airlines themselves. My understanding is most folks that are booking these onboard couriers to kind of hand carry that organ are ones where they maybe they're in an odd spot in the country and everything they take, they've got to take, they've got to have a connection, right? And oh, okay. that's yeah. the most you know, concerning part, you don't have to worry about one flight, you have to worry about two, at least with one flight, you know, once it's board, once it's been loaded onto the plane, you feel confident, right? It's, it's going to arrive at the destination. It's those connecting flights that are the more challenging ones. And so having that onboard courier is a bit of a peace of mind. But like Chris said, you know, you may not be able to get an onboard courier because again, we don't know that that organ is going to be on that flight until, you know, the day of. And so there's a good chance right. that, that, organ, that flight's already booked. And so that's where, you know, it, it's not a scalable option, but it does work in those yeah, tight spots. Yeah. in those tight spots and those individual cases. How do you get an organ through security though? I mean, are there special dispensation? I mean, cause I, I know like if you freeze your water bottle, you can carry it through, but if any little bit, it's a little bit, if it's melted, they're going to make you dump the whole thing. Like how does the TSA react to, hi, I have a pair of kidneys or, or a kidney in this cooler? It's interesting because I've, I've gone through security at, at general aviation with organs and they can put them through the x-ray machine if they need to. And, you know, they're packaged. Well, yeah. yeah. So if they are in a cooler, you can put them through x-ray and it's, there's no harm to the organ. And we've done that before. I don't know what TSA's process is for cargo, but you know, there's no harm in, it, in having it go through x-ray when it's in a box or a cooler. It's obviously a different matter when it's on a pump. Um, but I think when we're traveling from point A to point B, I don't want to give this impression that we don't get great support from cargo because the truth is that I've had cargo people bend over backwards to make sure that things get where they need to go or are pulled off the plane early. You know, the first thing out of the cargo is, you know, we've had, oh, tight connection and 
the cargo guy is going to go and get it off the plane and walk it right over to the other plane. So I actually think that the cargo people have been vital in making sure this happens safely. We had an experience years ago where, you know, cargo area closed and a guy from the cargo went back and got the kidney and gave it to the courier. So at least my own experiences, we've had really positive interactions with the cargo officials that have understood the importance and the benefit that this provides to people. Yeah, exactly. I don't think we should give that impression because from everything that I know about working with people within the airline industry is is that they will bend over backwards when there's a good reason to do so. And, and I can't really think of a better reason to do so. You know, I know people that'll make sure that, you know, somebody will get there for a tight connection just when it's, you know, a normal family reunion. So like having this particular reason, I, I can't imagine anyone would, you know, not you know, do the best they, they can to make sure that everything goes well. I want to thank you both so much for joining us and, and talking about this with us. I really appreciate your expertise and your time. We've been chatting with Casey Humphreys, who is the logistical products service line leader. The title doesn't do her justice for United Network for Organ Sharing and Chris Curran, who's the SVP of Organ Utilization for New England Donor Services. Thank you so much again for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, thank you, Chris and Casey. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thank you both. This has been great. Appreciate your time. Welcome back. I learned so much from that, that conversation. was definitely up there as one of the most interesting conversations we've had, I think. I didn't know what to expect going in into that conversation. And I'm glad I didn't have a ton of expectations about where things were going to go because I, I learned so much. It was just fascinating to think about working on something like that on a day in, day out, trying to make sure that you know all of those life-saving things are like just all of those puzzle pieces need to fit together every day, 30,000 times a year. Yeah. It sounds like an extremely stressful job, but I'm, I'm happy we learned more about it. I am happy I didn't delete the PR pitch without opening it as I usually do. So we were <laughs> able to have that conversation. But everything about that was, those are the greatest interviews where we truly don't know a damn thing about the topic and we get to learn and you get to learn and we all get to learn. And I have... I'm not going to say a newfound respect for that particular industry because who wouldn't respect it? But I have a newfound respect for a deeper. how freaking hard it is. Yes, yeah, a deeper, deeper understanding of how complicated it is and how few people run around with an organs in a cooler yelling, get this somewhere stat in a helicopter. I'm <laughs> yeah, disappointed about that's, that. Yeah, that, that, that's very rare, I guess. So let that be our pitch to you. If you've got something that you A, want to talk about, that you think is interesting that we should learn about, please email us at podcast.fr24.com. Or if you say, hey, I want to learn about this, go find somebody to talk about it. We'll do that too. And so just email us, podcast at fr24.com, and you'll listen to it on a future show. We've got some things to run through before we get to the end of the show, some news and notes about where aircraft are going and where they have been. This time, maybe, possibly, could be, I don't want to jinx it. China Southern might operate the first Chinese carrier 737 MAX flight this weekend or, or on Friday. It's on the app. It's in their schedule. They might fly it, but they might not because this – I don't want to get Charlie Brown with the football again like we did in October, but it, it's I, entirely I, possible. If it's going to happen, this is probably more real than the last time since, since then, COVID zero has ended and China is open and people can actually move about the country. So they probably do need aircraft in their fleet that they didn't need the last time this came around. So fingers crossed, I, I believe this one is much more likely than the last time because they need the damn aircraft. Yep, that's a good point. They need the planes, so they might as well fly them. The last 747 produced has been painted. N863GT is now wearing a, I almost said special livery. Standard livery. Well, boring livery. Not special livery. It's non-standard. It's not standard, not in the way it needs to be non-standard. Right, right. It's, what is it? An Atlas aircraft with uh, some co-branding from someone else I don't yeah, care a about. Apex Logistics, yes. 
whomever the hell that is, doesn't matter. What's important is that there is nothing, no permanent paint on that aircraft to notate that it is the last ever 747. However, there have been somewhat reliable rumors that it will get a Joe Sutter decal of some sort, which I hear is going to be extraordinary. And when I hear decal, I, I think uh, it's not great. That's not permanent. Uh, it'll get scratched up or dinged or taken off. But I've heard that it's so special that they actually made two of them and gave Atlas a second backup in case they need a spare sometime wow. in the future. And there, there are some times that decals stay on aircraft forever. I remember JetBlue had a Simpsons movie decal on one of its A320s, and it stayed on that airplane for so long until it just faded away from the sun that you couldn't see it anymore. It was small, but I'm, I'm fingers crossed that Boeing pulls something out of a hat because at this point, they've barely even acknowledged that this is happening so far. I mean, we've been kind of after Boeing about this on the podcast, and they finally released a video early this week. Recorded months prior. Yeah, recorded when the aircraft was still in production, was still being assembled, and basically said, it, we're coming to an end. Send us what you got about this M47, how you feel about it. I think Jason and I are going to put something together for that. But – Ah, but Ian, we have breaking news. Oh, dear. Out from the FAA, a statement – I will read it in whole. Sam Sweeney has tweeted it from ABC. I'll just read this whole statement. The ground stop and FAA system failures this morning appear to have been the result of a mistake that occurred during a routine scheduled systems maintenance, according to a senior official briefed on the internal review. Oh, so this isn't an FAA statement. I'm just reading Sam Sweeney's uh, snippet of his article. He goes on to say, an engineer replaced one file with another, the official said, not realizing the mistake was being made Tuesday. As the systems began showing problems and ultimately failed, FAA staff feverishly tried to figure out what had gone wrong. The engineer who made the error did not realize what had happened. They go on to say it was an honest mistake that cost the country millions, the official said, the unnamed official. Congressional hearings are expected, blah, 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 blah. So not terribly unsurprising that someone may have fat-fingered a file or someone up loaded something in an XLS instead of CSV file or something stupid like that. But there we go. We're starting to get more and more information on whatever it is happened this morning. Doesn't explain what happened with Canada and how that happened simultaneously on the same day. But more information is already getting out, but the FAA itself has not uh, confirmed this information. Well, it didn't happen on the same day. It happened on the day after the initial problem. So my question is, how long does it take to drive from the FAA headquarters up to NAV Canada's headquarters? And is that contractor employed by the same people? Yeah. You think it's the same guy just going around uh, <laughs> I mean, I uploading the so. same when, 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 corrupted I mean, file? Oh, you know, I just, it's just like he's just the, he's the IT guy driving around you know, doing the updates. Man, contractors, you can't trust them. Oh, boy. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. You know, obviously, oh, I, I, I skipped this paragraph, but it goes on to say, had the FAA's new NOTAM system been in place, redundancies mm. would have likely stopped the cascading failures. With the antiquated systems in place, there's nothing to stop, blah, 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 blah. And we looked into this a little bit, and apparently you looked into it this morning, yep. that there has been an effort to replace the NOTAM system for like a decade, and I don't think there's anything to show for it just yet. Not nearly enough to show for it, which I certainly hope that becomes a part of the push to keep things moving. Go back and listen to episode 65. Yes, please. Please do. We'll put a link in the show notes. Okay. Where were we? We got interrupted by breaking news. Wow. That's amazing. That never happens. It's supposed that to happen in happens. three minutes from now when we exactly. stopped. Next up, we already mentioned this a little bit earlier. Alaska is taking a couple steps closer to once again becoming an all Boeing airline. Proudly all Boeing Proudly airline. Proudly all Excuse Boeing. Yeah. Me. You have to be proud about that. Today, or this week rather, saw the shuttling of its entire remaining A320 fleet out to Victorville. So they are no longer flying any A320s. They do still have a handful of A321neos that they are regrettably getting rid of by the end of this year. Hopefully not too soon because I should be on one later this month or next month, I think. But also the Dash 8 Q400s, like we mentioned, there are only a handful left in the fleet and they should be gone in a couple weeks. So if you are an Alaska passenger or were formerly a Virgin America passenger, basically all signs of that airline ever having existed will be gone shortly. Sorry. And there it is. Yeah, I'm How bummed sad. out. I'm bummed out. Yeah, yeah. But what are you going to do? 
Talk about some DC 10s. There you go. Also leaving fleets worldwide is the DC 10. So so FedEx up until more precisely aren't they MD 10s? Okay, well, I'm getting there. Let's get pedantic about it. They're MD 10s. <laughs> okay. All right. FedEx up until a couple of weeks ago had been the world's largest operator of the DC 10 airframe. Okay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> FedEx had upconverted their DC-10s to MD-10s. MD-10s are basically DC-10 airframes that have had the avionics changed out so that they have type commonality with the MD-11 so a pilot can fly both and not have to worry about changing between the two aircrafts and having more than one type certification, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing is, is that the DC-10 is really, really on its last legs here. Outside of government flying, basically the the KC-10 for the United States Air Force, there are just a handful still flying and they just kind of pop up here and there because they're used so infrequently. So I think at this point, the the most the easiest to find DC-10 is going to have to be the tab cargo flying in and out of Miami. Oh yeah, I've seen that one too. It's a good looking aircraft. Yeah. So not many DC-10s left flying around after FedEx's retirement. And then Finally, an interesting thing happened yesterday. There's a hundred and some odd thousand flights every day, 150, 60, 70, 80, depending on time of the year and but who's and all that fuss. Yeah, if only there was a website to, to count those things. But the moral of the story is that there are dozens of diversions every day for reasons as exciting as a baby being born on the aircraft to a light bulb went out. And so we have to go back and make sure because it's a really important light bulb. <laughs> and everything in between. Delta Flight 221 yesterday was making its way out of Europe and back over to the US. And it was flying- Paris to Salt Lake City. Yeah, and Paris to Salt Lake City. Just north northwest of Ireland. That's what I was trying to say. I got you. That's why I'm Thank the co-host. You. But it signaled that they started diverting back towards Europe, but not towards- where you would expect, not towards Paris, not towards Dublin, not towards London, or anywhere that you would think a flight would divert to. But they filed to fly all the way down to Madrid. And that's like five hours away from where they were. So it was a very curious head scratcher. I don't recall seeing a uh, a diversion of that nature. For Usually when you see something like that, they're like over northern Canada and have to go all the way back down to like Seattle or something, right? Which coincidentally happened earlier in the week. There was a flight that was over northern Canada and basically was due north of Seattle and, and then ended up diverting there. But this particular flight is interesting because you know the ability of people who know about things to post that knowledge on Twitter in near real time is just a very valuable thing that we've discussed multiple times. And in this particular instance, there was someone who was reading the ACARS messages from the aircraft, and the ACARS messages said that one of the engines had an anti-ice issue. And so I pulled up the icing forecast map. And as it turns out, there was icing forecast for Paris, for London, for Dublin, for Shannon, for all of these other you know airports that were much closer to where the aircraft needed to start diverting. And as it turns out, Madrid was the closest and best suitable airport that where the aircraft would not have to deal with icing on approach. Um, so these things all make sense. And we've talked about this before is that you know, there's always a reason. And the reason is yeah, always a good one. Which is exactly what I tweeted. The only thing I can think of is that maybe this part exists in Madrid and it doesn't exist elsewhere. I don't know. And then Twitter did its thing as, it's yep. always, as it always does. And then one person used a source that I didn't even know existed. Did you? I think you knew it existed, that you can pull ACARS information pretty much anywhere, kind of just like ADSB. It's crowdsourced on the internet and you can search it. And from there, I said, okay, why would anti-ice matter? And people said, oh, well, you can't. Fly through icing conditions if your anti ice doesn't work. And the nearest place that Delta operates to that doesn't have icing conditions or icing conditions in route is the most important part of that was Madrid. And Delta ended up con- confirming that and saying that the aircraft landed without incident before it actually landed. <laughs> yeah, they all, were, which they is, were not they, close. They were to really, landing. really positive that aircraft was going to land without incident. But it was just really one of those great internet detective moments putting together all those things and saying, huh. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
Turns out these people do know what they're doing. Surprise, surprise. And Mm -hmm. on that note, we're going to leave that to the folks who know what they're doing and call this a wonderful episode 198. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. We we really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Casey and Chris. And I know that, that Jason and I were just left kind of dumbfounded at how much work goes into that and each and every day. And as we learn more about the FAA's ground stop and NOTAM outage issues, I'm sure we'll have more to say on that next week. But for now, thank you so much for listening. This has been episode 198. I am Ian Pechnik here, as always, with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.